Okay, it's working. My voice coming all right? Yes, okay. Well, welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Nusret Tash, and I will be talking about our work, uh, Atomic and Fair Data Exchange via Blockchain. This is joint work with my uh, wonderful colleagues, uh, Istvan, Yino, Mark, Mahimna, Joe, and Lera. So let me jump right into it. So I would like to start by uh, explaining the fair data exchange problem. So this problem uh, involves two parties, a server that holds some data, and uh, there is perhaps a succinct commitment to this data uh, up in the cloud that is publicly accessible by everyone, and there is a client that holds some payment, and the client would like to retrieve the data uh, by paying for it. Now, our goal is to basically design a protocol where the client and the server communicate with each other. And as a result of this communication, the server obtains the payment and client obtains the data. And as you can see, there's some formatting error, which wasn't there two seconds ago, but let's stick with that. Um, yeah, so our goal is to achieve this, and we would like any protocol achieving this to satisfy three main properties. The first one is correctness. So the correctness states that if the client and the server are honest, then the client obtains the data and uh, the server obtains the payment. However, we would like to guard the system against adversarial clients, and this is captured by server fairness, which states that an adversarial client should not learn anything about the data without paying the server the correct amount the server asked for. And similarly, uh, we would like to guard it against adversarial server captured by this property client fairness, which states that an adversarial server should not receive any payment if the client does not obtain the data it asked for, namely the data underlying the commitment. Okay? Now, unfortunately, there is an impossibility result. It's a well-known result from late 90s. This, it's impossible to achieve all these three properties without a trusted third party. But the name of this conference is Science of Blockchain, right? So we do have block blockchains as our trusted third party, so this gives us some hope about achieving that. But before I explain how we can use blockchains for that, let me motivate this problem further. We, in fact, could use a fair data exchange uh, scheme for protodunk sharding. And how does this work? So in protodunk sharding, there is this blob data that is uh, eventually um, kicked out of the chain, but it can be stored off-chain by some uh, volunteering servers, right? So here we can see the blob data. Now, a commitment to this blob data, a KZG commitment, continues to live on-chain, so it, is a, a, it continues to live on Ethereum, but the servers are just volunteering to store and serve it to clients in the future. Now, we can use RFD scheme to motivate these servers to keep storing it, by enabling clients to pay for this uh, data in an atomic and uh, trust-free manner. So this is one application of it, the fair data exchange, and other applications could perhaps include uh, uh, exchange of other archival blockchain data, motivating servers to keep storing other archival blockchain data, and uh, facilitating data marketplaces over the chain, such as uh, clients would like to, they could, they could want to stream movies, and now they could perhaps purchase the movie over the blockchain. Okay, so now we are equipped with the blockchain as a trusted third party. Let me give a straw man solution. So our straw man solution starts with the client locking some payment in a contract on the blockchain. Now, the server, in order to unlock this payment and retrieve the coins, it sends the data, the full data, to the blockchain. You might have some question marks here, but uh, hold on to that. Now, the blockchain checks if the data the server posted is indeed the correct data the client is asking for, namely the data underlying the commitment. And if that is the case, it lets the server withdraw the coins that the client locked. And finally, the client can read the data from the blockchain, and uh, this way it will obtain the data, and the server will end up obtaining the payment. However, there is a major problem here. All data is posted to the blockchain, so we are using the trusted third party in a very heavy manner, and blockchains are notoriously limited in terms of computation and uh, storage. Right? And uh, to give an example, uh, posting one megabyte of data to Ethereum, even after all of these updates, would still cost uh, 2,500 uh, US dollars. 
Now, in our protocol, we would like to uh, offer a solution for that. And our solution works as follows. We will first have the server encrypt the data. Then it will transfer the encrypted data off chain. So most of the data will be going to the client without touching the blockchain at all. But now the data is encrypted, so the client doesn't know what data it received, let alone whether it received the correct one. So the server will sell the decryption key on chain. So whatever touches the on chain will be a succinct decryption key. Okay, so this seems like a viable uh, solution. However, now how does the client know that the key that it will buy from the server on chain is gonna actually decrypt the ciphertext to the correct data, namely the data underlying the commitment, right? So here the server must actually prove to the client that the key it's gonna sell eventually is gonna decrypt the ciphertext to the data under the commitment, okay? So to achieve this, to help the server prove to the client this fact, we will need a new cryptographic primitive that we call verifiable encryption under committed key, or VEC for short. So this is a variation on the verifiable encryption. So it consists of five algorithms. So we first generate the public parameters and you should think of all future algorithms taking these public parameters as input. There is an encrypt algorithm that is run by the server. It takes the commitment to a witness and the witness W as input. Right here, witness, uh, by witness, you should think of our data, and it outputs a verification key, a decryption key, a ciphertext, and a proof pi. So well, what are these objects for? Well, so in particular, what is this proof pi proving? The proof pi is proving that the ciphertext CT is the encryption of the data, the correct encryption committed by the commitment C uh, under the decryption key SK that is committed by the verification key VK. So VK commits to the SK, and C commits to the data, right? So our proof is proving that. Now, we have a key verification algorithm that is run by the blockchain contract, and it basically checks if you give me a verification key and a decryption key, whether the verification key commits to the decryption key. So it checks if this commitment is correct. And we have a ciphertext verification algorithm, uh, which checks if I'm given a commitment, a verification key, a ciphertext, and a proof, whether the ciphertext is the correct encryption of the data committed by the C commitment, right, under the decryption key committed by the verification key VK. So it outputs one if this is true, and decryption simply decrypts the data. Okay, so these are our five algorithms, and the bottom two are run by the client. Now, we would like our, this VEX scheme to satisfy three uh, perhaps basic properties. Uh, these are really important, but uh, they, will, they sound familiar. So first one is correctness. Both verification steps for key and the ciphertext must succeed uh, for honestly generated encryption. And this is gonna imply the correctness of our fair data exchange scheme. The second one is soundness. So no efficient adversary should be able to generate these uh, SK, VK, CT, and PI such that the verifications succeed, both of them, but the decryption would not output the witness. Um, so no, if no adversary is able to do that, then we can uh, infer the client fairness of the fair data exchange. Because now the server will not be able to fool the client by giving it some uh, uh, values that for which the verifications succeed, but the client won't be able to obtain the data. And finally, we would like to enforce computational zero knowledge uh, the ciphertext and the proof should leak no additional information uh, about our data. And this would imply the server fairness of the fair data exchange scheme. Now, uh, because our main one of our main motivations is to use this for uh, proto dank sharding, in particular to uh, incentivize the servers to keep storing the data in proto dank sharding, we are gonna assume that our commitment to the data is a KZG commitment, a polynomial KZG commitment which means that our witness is a polynomial and data is simply corresponds to the evaluations of these polynomial at these points and the commitment is the KZG commitment. Okay, so now equipped with this object, let's see how we can achieve the uh, fair data exchange protocol. So as the first step, the server will run the encryption algorithm on the data and it will output a verification key, a decryption key, a ciphertext and a proof pi. Then it will post the verification key to a contract on the blockchain. Then it will send the ciphertext and the proof to the client off-chain. Note that most of this data is transferred off-chain. 
then the client is gonna verify this proof with respect to the verification key on the blockchain contract and the ciphertext it's received off chain. And if, this, if the output of this verification is one, then what the client will do is it's gonna lock the payment, okay? Now, once the server observes the payment is being locked, it will send a decryption key to the blockchain contract and the contract is gonna check if the decryption key matches the verification key, the commitment to the decryption key. If this uh, answer is one, then uh, the contract is gonna allow the server to withdraw the coins that the client locked up. And now finally, the client can indeed read the decryption key from the blockchain contract and using the decryption key, it can decrypt the ciphertext and obtain the data. So this is the full protocol once we are uh, equipped with this uh, VEX scheme. Okay, but where, where did this VEX scheme come from, right? Like how do we, how do, where does it even, where do we even get it? So now I would like to describe a very simple VEX scheme, uh, assuming that we use Elgamal as our uh, as encryption scheme to generate the cipher text. So here are our, our public parameters, some group elements, and the encryption algorithm run by the server, our prover here, is gonna be simply sampling a random field element. It will be our Elgamal decryption key, and the corresponding commitment verification key to it will be this va value shown here and the prover is gonna generate these Algamal ciphertexts. Now, for now, let's assume these data points, right? Remember that the data was the evaluation of the polynomial at these points. They, let's assume they're small so we can easily decrypt the Algamal ciphertext. And for the proof, the prover is just gonna use a generic zero-knowledge snack. So, uh, with the instance being the commitment verification key, the ciphertext, the witness being the, uh, the the decryption key and the polynomial, the witness. Okay, then it sends over this verification key ciphertext and pi to the verifier, uh, which is our client here, and it outputs, it, it verifies the ciphertext if the proof verifies. It's uh, as simple as that, it's just checking the snark proof. And the decryption is a decryption for Algamal and the blockchain contract in order to uh, verify if the decryption key matches the commitment, the verification key, it simply checks this relation, the same relation as the generation. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, is this the end of the talk? Well, not really. So, note that when we use a generic zero knowledge snark here, we are including the encryption as part of the snark relation. And uh, we realize that this might not always be the most efficient thing to do. So what we do in our work instead is we design an efficient VEC protocol that exploits the shared structure of the Elgamal ciphertext and the KZG commitments. If you look at how these, how these are constructed, they have a shared structure. And furthermore, I did assume the evaluations of the polynomial are small. We don't, oh, before that, uh, <laughs> I like to flash that meme. Uh, if you are really up to your uh, current memes, you would maybe immediately get it. But what this means is that we don't need this heavy equipment of a zero knowledge snark. We have our own scheme that are, that's more uh, open box. So, <laughs> and uh, furthermore, we can uh, indeed support uh, large um, the, the, the data elements. They, we don't need to assume they are small by splitting the large messages into smaller pieces, perhaps by device, splitting them into like chunks of uh, eight or 16 chunks. And then of course we need to show each chunk is small with range proofs and we can batch them as well. Okay, uh, <laughs> enough of the meme. Uh, unfortunately, there is a drawback here. Well, this step blows up the ciphertext size by K, which could be eight or 16, right? Now, uh, what, what do we do about that? Uh, we, in re response to that, we designed another VEX scheme uh, that is now not based on um, Elgamal encryption, but it's based on Polya encryption. And this avoids the ciphertext blow up by a factor of K, at least theoretically. And then we have shown that both of these schemes are secure. First, assuming decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, we showed that the Elgamal-based VEC protocol satisfy correctness, uh, soundness, and computational zero knowledge. Recall that these imply the correctness, the client fairness, and server fairness of our FTE scheme in the random oracle algebraic group models. And uh, similarly, for the Palier-based VEC protocol, assuming the DCR, decisional composite residuosity assumption, we can prove security in the uh, random oracle and algebraic group models. Okay. 
I mean, so, okay, so far I have assumed there are only two parties, a single server, a single client. Well, there's also our trusted third party, I'm not even counting that, our blockchain contract. But in reality, multiple clients might want to purchase the same data. That is uh, plausible. Like just going back to our data marketplace movie example, it's not true that each movie is watched by only one person in the world. So in this case, server can ask itself the question, can I save some work by amortizing my proof generation across these many different clients, right? Well, here's a straw man idea. Why don't you just generate your proof once? Just generate a secret key once, a verification key, a ciphertext once, and reuse that for all of the clients. Well, there's an issue here because first of all, to sell the secret key to the first client, you're already posting it to the contract, right? Now all other clients can read this uh, the decryption secret key, sorry, the decryption key from the contract, and they, they, they don't need to ask for, they don't need to buy the key anymore from the server. Now you might say, okay, we can maybe fix this. I can maybe encrypt the decryption key to the public key of the client and do a more complicated proof and resolve this issue. But there is another uh, drawback here, which uh, perhaps is much harder to resolve, which is the fact that these clients might be talking to each other, right? So perhaps they won't talk to each other too much because like if each client just serves the full data to its peers, then it will be acting as a server. So we cannot, then we also cannot do really anything. So we won't be assuming clients can tell the whole data, but it's plausible that each client will tell each other this uh, decryption key that it obtained from the server. Okay. In particular, maybe each client can tell each other the other peers that uh, data that is uh, succinct in the size of the full data that they are, they are asking from the server. This tells us that we must, or the server must, re-randomize the decryption key across the clients in order to amortize some work. And we indeed uh, give a multi-client version of our VEC protocol in the paper called MCVEC, where the prover saves some work by moving parts of proof generation to a pre-processing step. In particular, the ciphertext generation and the range proof generation for the Algamal-based VEC, they are both moved into the pre-processing step. So the, the, the step that is done per client only involves re-randomization of this uh, decryption key and uh, generating some elements associated with that. So we will now soon see how this helps us. So now I have been talking about how we designed this more efficient scheme, but uh, well, what makes it more efficient, right? Now everyone wants to see some numbers. Uh, so let me briefly talk about the implementation. So we created a proof of concept implementation um, in Rust on a consumer laptop. Um, I should warn that this is a very uh, early uh, proof of concept implementation. It can be improved in multiple ways, even with known optimizations. And here is our prover time for 4096 field elements that would, could be used to generate the BLS123801 group elements. And the, the total size would be roughly 128 kilobytes. And uh, for, the, for this plain text size of the data size of 128 kilobytes, we observed that uh, in the uh, exponential algamal encryption case with a blow up factor of eight, the range proof and ciphertext generation takes 89 seconds, but the overhead for proving the consistency of this ciphertext with respect to the commitment and the verification key is only 40 milliseconds. So what does this mean? This means that the pre-processing step in the previous multi-client uh, VEC case will be the 89 seconds, but per client, the extra work I will need to do will be on the order of milliseconds. And for the Polyar encryption, the, this, uh, this proof generation, the runtime of this encrypt algorithm will be roughly five seconds. And here you can see how it changes as we vary the data size. Okay. Now let me briefly talk about the proof size. Um, so the proof size for the exponential algamal case will uh, exhibit a blow up factor of 12x. So here this blow up is compared to the plain text size. Now most of this blow up is coming from the ciphertext because the proof is constant in the size of the, the plain text. It's just six group elements, assuming we can batch the uh, range proofs. 
In the polyer encryption case, uh, interestingly, the blow-up factor is 50, which is worse than the exponential algorithm, even though our original motivation was to avoid this K factor, right? The K blow-up factor in the algorithm case. Well, the reason is because the polyer group, uh, in, in, in the polyer case, the group elements are much larger, and also the, are the proof is has linear size in the data, unlike in the exponential algorithm case. And it's a, uh, this, this should not like discourage people. It might be possible to pack multiple plain text elements into a single uh, polyer ciphertext. So we haven't done this packing, but this might be a future direction to reduce this 50 times blow up. And for the verification and decryption times, we observed that for the exponential algorithm case, the decryption time would be very quick with lookup tables. And uh, for the polyer case, it's on the order of seconds. Yeah, and now uh, let's, uh, we are getting close to the end, but uh, let's uh, have a more positive note, the on-chain costs. So the whole motivation was to reduce the on-chain costs here. Have we actually achieved our goal? Well, we did because the on-chain cost is constant in the size of the exchange data. It's simply three signatures, one, uh, and one verification key and one decryption key posted on-chain. And uh, how, ma how, how many dollars is that? So what is our metric here? Well, on the Ethereum L1, there is uh, the, the amount that the server and the client would need to pay for these posting operations will be very little, like on the order of a few dollars at most. And here are some of the uh, for functions, sorry, uh, here are some of the um, transactions run by the clients and the server. So this one registers the server's verification key on chain. This one locks the client's payment. This one verifies the, the, if the decryption key and the verification key matches. And this one enables the server to withdraw the payment. And as you can see, they are quite small. But if you're not satisfied with that, not with these numbers, you can go even smaller on L2. Of course, this is not too surprising, but could be made uh, even 200 times less. Um, yeah, so we have uh, presented a scheme, a fair data exchange scheme based on verifiable encryption for committed keys uh, and with a focus on KZG commitments uh, and in, with an application in mind for proto dank sharding. And if you can consult our paper for more details on how you can use Bitcoin instead of Ethereum as this trusted third party blockchain uh, with the help of adapter signatures. They, they could be used to replace the uh, emulate this contracts role. And uh, how to support uh, verifiable encryption uh, for committed keys for subsets of the data. Maybe you're not asking for the full data under a certain commitment, but on a subset of it, so we can support that. And you can check out our definitions for those as well if you want to design them for different commitment schemes. And there are some future directions I would uh, encourage people to look into. Uh, for the, the first one is I mentioned the polyer encryption has a large blow up factor, perhaps it, because the proof size is linear in the size of the data. So can we have a constant size proof for that? Uh, can we design these VEC schemes for other commitments and encryption schemes? Um, can we avoid the griefing vector for the server, which means that a client asks for this encryption and the proof, then disappears, right? Then now our server did some work and then it can't, can't get paid for it. So we have some ideas for it in the paper, uh, but uh, it will be good to think about that. And of course, there's this general question of how do we price the data? So far, we only let the server decide the price and the client pays for it. But uh, perhaps maybe there might be some dynamic pricing depending on there is how much client demand there is. And you can consult these links for a blog post with a summary of our work, our paper, and the open source implementation. Thank you. Hey, we have time for a couple of questions. And perhaps I'll ask a question. So it seems that your solution doesn't yet scale to large quantities of data. Have you looked at perhaps using proofs of retrievability or proofs of data possession as a, a way to accomplish that kind of scaling? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we thought about it. Proofs of retrievability is not enough for our goals. So proof of retrievability or, okay, more like proof of replication, for instance, like those things, they prove to me that the data is being stored by the server. 
but in a proof of replication, there is no guarantee that the server will actually pay, give me the data if I ask for the data. For instance, that they can keep posting these proofs on chain to get a reward, right? But now if I want to buy it, they can just disappear. Oh, I meant as a way to show that the ciphertext was correctly constructed. Oh, yeah, that could be a potential direction. Uh, I think we have another question here. Um, thanks a lot for the great talk and the great work. Uh, that's an amazing contribution. I wanted to ask about how do you make it work for Bitcoin? Um, can you give a few more details, please? Yeah, um, so in the Bitcoin case, uh, how it would work is the, as follows. So if you recall in the, uh, let's, let's look at the algamal based VEC, right? Uh, there, there is this uh, decryption key and the commitment to the decryption key, the verification key is basically a group element multiplied by this uh, the decryption key. So this is actually, this is actually a relation, right? Uh, there with a witness and a problem instance and you can design an adapter signature for this relation. And then how it would work is essentially in order to, so the client is gonna log some money and this money will be, the client will be able to take this money after some time lock if the server doesn't exist or if it disappears. But if the server is actually there, the server will need to post two things to retrieve this payment from the client, the, the, the locked payment. First, it needs to post a signature under its own uh, uh, say secret key, like secret public key. Second, it needs to post an adapter signature. And uh, how it's gonna get the adapter signature, and uh, basically it's gonna get a pre-signature from the client, and the server will need to adapt this pre-signature. And while it's adapting this pre-signature, the pre-signature will be revealing this uh, decryption key. And then the client now can read the decryption key from Bitcoin, perhaps the mempool, and then decrypt the ciphertext. So that's how the adapter signature solution would work. Is that clear? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Okay. okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.